Hello, everyone, and welcome again to another episode of M365 Voice. My name is Mike Marani. I'm Sarah Hazi. And I'm Antonio Maya. And today we have a special guest with us, Andrew Connell, a longtime friend, a longtime MVP, expert in SharePoint. But Andrew, welcome. We're very excited to have you here. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate you guys having me. Uh, yeah, it's been a long time in SharePoint. I don't recommend people do SharePoint as long as I've done it. Um, <laughs> it goes like 20, it's almost 20, 21 years now. So it's crazy. <laughs> Not recommended for your health and well-being and anger management. The joke that I have is that I've already been through the 12 steps. I'm on like step 23 now, so I wouldn't, I don't recommend it, but that's mm -hmm. not true. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm just, it was a joke. <laughs> and and you've been, you've been a Microsoft MVP, I think for longer than all of us, right? Like how long have you been in the MVP program? Um, I got my 20th renewal uh, back in July of this year. So I think my first award was in 2005. Okay. Um, wow. It was, went, started with Microsoft Content Management Server, then it was SharePoint, then it was Office 365 dev for a while. They had me listed as an IT pro, which was could not be more foreign from the truth. So you've been um, an MVP yeah. longer than you've had kids. I that's true. I have. Wow. Okay. Almost. That's impressive. Yeah, I did almost. that math in my head real quick, and I'm like, whoa. That's how it feels. Yes. And those little crystal like half circle thing hockey pucks that we have, they yeah. remind you of that too. Yeah. Yeah. That you're not as young as you used to be. And it feels it. Getting a 20-year award and like a, a message from the MVP person, like, oh, that's 20 years. That's a lot. And I'm like, thanks. Yeah, it feels like that. <laughs> Ouch. I feel yeah. every bit of that when I wake up in the morning some days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But, I mean, it's all good. I mean, it's mostly I've lived in the SharePoint development world um, almost the entire time. Um, there was a time for about three or four years where I tried to get away from SharePoint. Uh, after doing it for 10 years, I was like, I just want to do something different. Nothing against SharePoint. It was like, change it up. And I got pulled back in when Microsoft released the SharePoint framework. Um, okay. uh -huh. I saw how it was going to affect people. And I was like, I know the old world. I know the new world. I know how it's going to affect people. I frankly, I saw an opportunity to build a course out of it. So I was like, okay, I'll come back. And now it's just spending more time. I do a lot of SharePoint framework development still, but it's I spend a lot more time um, in Teams development, um, and I've done worked with a bunch of customers on uh, SharePoint Embedded uh, since it was announced as well. So I know that's what we're going to talk about today. So I've been spending I spent more time there working with the product group and with some customers uh, adopting it. And I I don't think it's a stretch to say that probably every SharePoint framework developer in the world has benefited from your content and your courses and your contributions. Like myself and, and the team that I run here at my company um, very much has benefited from your content. So thank you for all that through the years. I appreciate that. Thank you. It's been- And uh, that is something to say right there. I yeah. think that that is a more stellar compliment than, that is probably the best compliment that I've heard of a Microsoft MVP right there. I appreciate that. Thank you for both of y'all. It's very nice of you to say. That's yeah, amazing. Absolutely. Yeah, same here. And we have him here on our podcast. Uh -huh. <laughs> I get to be on your show. That's the exciting part. <laughs> Actually, I uh, talking about Shampoo Embedded, we're going to start about it. But when I when it was first announced, I'm like, what the hell is this? And then I'm like, I could not understand. Like, I didn't have time to go and read much about it. I'm like, and then I hit your blog post. And I'm like, oh, and you had a small video about it. I'm like, hey, yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah, well, so you contributed to all our starting things. point. Is yeah. can you give us the well maybe two hundred level on what it is? Sure, sure. So um, if you best way to, I like to start with this discussion is uh, you know if you've ever worked with a customer who they want to build like some sort of a system, be it a web app, be it whatever kind of a system, and they want to but they want to store all the content in SharePoint document libraries because. Um, you need a place to store them, but then in, in addition, they want all of the enterprise content management features that SharePoint has to offer, which have now turned into being over over the years, have turned into being the uh, best in class uh, services from versioning to records holds to um, uh, ver uh, uh, auditing, all the stuff that uh, Purview gives us for making sure there's like sensitivity labels and compliance, security and compliance. Now with all the AI stuff, search, all of those things. Um, people want to have that stuff inside of their own apps. And so in the past, 
It was, let's put all of our content inside SharePoint, and then we're going to build an app that's going to go get all that data out of SharePoint that we can work with. But the challenge that customers ran into was, we don't want SharePoint. We just want document libraries, and we want the features of those document libraries. Um, effectively, what Microsoft did, for years we've been asking for this, and what Microsoft did when they first, annou when they first um, announced it, it was called Repository as a Service. Um, and this was, I think it was announced at Build 2023. Uh -huh. um, it's evolved to having the name SharePoint Embedded. And effectively, all it is, is just a place for you to store your content, file-based content in SharePoint document libraries, but it's separate from the rest of your SharePoint. So there is no SharePoint web interface. There is no, the only way you can get to the data that's inside of these document libraries is through an app that you create and using the APIs that Microsoft gives us. Full stop, that's it. Are they stored in the back end in different content databases or doesn't matter, you're just using, building an app to access right. it? So think about it like this. Um, when you create a new SharePoint, when you create a new, uh, a Microsoft 365 tenant, you get a couple different, they call them partitions. So we used to think about them as like content databases. Now that's kind of yep. like, it bleeds into, into you know, however they're doing it now, but uh, for scale reasons, but um, you get a partition. So you're going to get a OneDrive partition and you get a SharePoint partition. Um, the SharePoint partition is what SharePoint Online is. The OneDrive partition, a lot of stuff for document libraries. Um, now you also get a SharePoint embedded partition that sits parallel the same level with those other two. Um, all of it's inside of my Microsoft 365. So effectively you get this, it's basically the exact same thing as what SharePoint was, um, except it is only document libraries. There's no lists, there's no UI, no web UI or anything. Um, so it sits alongside and it sits alongside your existing content. But the other big benefit to SharePoint Embedded that they have to offer is that all of the content is stored in your tenant, but it doesn't count against your tenant. So if you have quotas with like, let's just say SharePoint in, SharePoint Online, you have a limit of one terabyte of content. I don't know what the number is. I'm not an IT pro, I'm a developer. So I look at that stuff later. Let's just say you were capped at one terabyte of content inside SharePoint Online. If I buy an app from some company, let's call it Contoso, and they store all their content in a SharePoint embedded uh, partition, then it's gonna be, all that content's gonna be stored in my tenant. But if it's 500 gigs, it doesn't take up any of that one terabyte. All of the storage is billed separately on a consumption basis for yeah. that SharePoint embedded instance of, of for that app. Um, but I get the option to benefit from all of the features that I have with my Microsoft 365 license. So purview, AI, search, um, all of that stuff is still available to me as a customer of that other product, that SharePoint embedded product, because the data lives inside of my tenant. Now, when I say you have the option is because the developer of the app has the ability to either turn on or turn, or by default it's turned off, but it's called Microsoft 365 Discovery. If it's turned off, none of the content in my SharePoint embedded tenant will show up in search. If it's turned on, it will show up in search. Copilot can see it, um, AI can see it, when I go to attach a file to an email, I'd be able to find it as like, just like you can see, like, where am I gonna pull this content from? This site collection, this OneDrive, or this SharePoint embedded app. That's awesome. Cool. That's interesting. So, so if I want to attach it to an email, I can actually navigate my SharePoint embedded partition and find a document. You would be able to, you'd actually navigate it by an app. So like the-, so, the Okay, the, the app you so, build. Yeah, so I'm using the term partition to just kind of explain like how everything is stored, but from a user perspective, they're just apps. So for example, uh, yeah, so Antonio, yeah, to answer your question, yes. If I want to attach, if I want to uh, attach a file to an email, just like when I say, where am I gonna get the file from? My computer, am I gonna get it from OneDrive, from SharePoint, you pick the site or you pick the team and you, all that kind of stuff. The same way you pick a SharePoint site, you would pick Andrew's SharePoint embedded app. And that would show up as like the root kind of folder for that um for that for that app um that is provided the app that you that you're using has turned that feature on by default it's turned off by default all this content is very siloed in its own wall garden one of the things that's interesting about this is that most microsoft 365 people at least people like us 
um, you're used to using SharePoint Embedded. You just don't know it. All content with Microsoft Designer, all content with Microsoft Loop is all stored in SharePoint Embedded containers. So it's that's how it's all. The app itself is Loop that Microsoft hosts, but Loop is accessing content inside of your SharePoint Embedded partition under all the containers that are just associated with Microsoft Loop. And that way the content is yours. It is encrypted under, if you have your own, like bring your own key, it's all encrypted under your stuff. It's just that that app has access to get to that content and that's it. Cool. So for our audience to, for them to kind of get them closer to the traditional SharePoint world that they know it, do you care about creating like file folders and metadata and all this stuff that comes with SharePoint? Or you really don't care because you're accessing all this information through the app. You're doing everything through the app. So the in the customer of these apps um, has no access to anything like that. They can't look at like columns. They can't look at uh, metadata, uh, the property bag, like tags. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't. There's no concept of content types with SharePoint embedded. Um, okay. That's intentional. Um, unless the developer of the app exposes that to the end user. So what's kind of cool about, especially for developers, this is really cool because when you teach this concept of SharePoint embedded, um, you there's a little bit of like concept that you have to understand and how everything is kind of architected and then how you create this SharePoint embedded, I'm gonna put it in air quotes, but you create this app, you have to create this thing called a container type, you have to register it, and mm -hmm. then your app then creates containers. A container is just a document library. Mm -hmm. So once you get to that point, the developers that are then going to go through and create these apps, um, they use all the exact same stuff they've used today to access content in SharePoint and in OneDrive. They just use Microsoft Graph and none of it is like anything new. There's nothing unique to it. So to that point, Mike, like there's no concept of like content types. Um, there is a metadata capabilities there, but like the permissioning is much simpler than we have in SharePoint. There's no destructive permissions like you can't break inheritance. It's all additive um, and there's no, um, in any of the metadata is all something that the app itself does. You think about this almost like white label SharePoint. It's like right. a white labeled SharePoint mm -hmm. where if I create a new instance of SharePoint, delete the lists and delete the web interface and that's it. I'm just left with a site collection, a single site collection that contains a single container that contains files, which is just a document library. And an app may create Ten, hundreds, thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of containers based on what the scenario is for the app. Got it. Yeah. So you you've got this functionality of versioning mm -hmm. and permissioning and metadata in SharePoint embedded. If you want to expose it to the user, you basically have to build that UI yourself into your app. That's correct. You build and it yourself. And then you're executing it on the user's behalf, or you could build that functionality into the design of your app without exposing it, meaning you could auto version or auto permission or auto label. Mm -hmm. You could do all that yourself if you like. You could do all of that. Um, you can create, so like, uh, and just to show you like how SharePointy it really is, um, none of what I'm about to say is exposed to the user. Again, unless the developer of the app is the one that actually exposes it, they create the UI to go through and do this stuff. But the, um, the they they can when I let's say like a good scenario for this is like a company that builds a uh, content management system for a law firm. So law firms have uh, when they have a case, there's matter associated with the case. Um, mm -hmm. What they would then do, what, what we're seeing is that you would create a separate container for each matter because that's like the atomic unit of like security that you would have. You if somebody has ac read access to a container, they have read access to everything. I can't in that container that you can't like go lower than that. If they are like, if they're a reader at the container, you can give grant them right access somewhere down inside the container or full control or manage. But I can't say that you're a writer and then I'm gonna remove like your write capability at one part inside of it. So it's a very, like I said, it's unlike SharePoint document libraries where permissions are just can be, um, you can break inheritance uh, with con with SharePoint embedded containers, it's all additive. I can't go through and break. I can't go in, in the negative uh, approach. That's solid. Yeah. So it's it it the part of that's for performance reasons. Um, as a long term SharePoint person, I will tell you that a lot of the decisions they've made really do simplify a lot of the conversations we have with customers. 
like the permissioning thing is one. Yeah. Um, the information architecture side of it is another one. Uh, it really does simplify a lot. But yeah, so I think uh, I just forgot who asked me the question. I think it might have been you, Antonio. It you you get all of that stuff that you want to be able to give the users, like add metadata, add like uh, name value pairs, like as a property kind of a thing to be able to search for that content uh, later on um, through the app. All that stuff is all implemented uh, from the developer. Um, for any developers that are listening to this too, if you like, we'll put it in the show notes, um, but I have like, I have an article and an associated video on YouTube that walks through this. And then I have an article, a separate, that goes through like an overview. And then I have an article that's a step-by-step -step tutorial of creating your first SharePoint embedded app. And it goes to the point where it doesn't go as far as showing you how to do like the metadata stuff, but I'm working on an updated version of it that will replace the one that's there to show you go, going through and doing that same thing of creating all that extra, the metadata and everything. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty powerful with it. One, so, oh, go ahead. I was going to say there is one really cool feature with this that is not, uh, that a lot of people don't pick up on. And that is, you know, with like SharePoint, if you want to give somebody access to content inside SharePoint, they have to be licensed, right? Yes. They have to have a license to it. Mm -hmm. um, external license, whatever. You, ha you have to be licensed to get to the content. SharePoint embedded? Because there's okay, no UI, cool. there's no license that's relevant. You're just right. exposing the files and using it as a data store. That's correct. There's nothing. So just like I've been added as a guest into your meeting to enter into this recording for the podcast, I could invite somebody in to come in to be as uh, to use this app. They would log in using Microsoft Intra. And now that I know who they are, they can access the content provided I've given them access to be able to view that content. And just because they can view the content or they can they have access to the content doesn't mean they can download it like i may it may be a bunch of word or excel documents if i give them a link to it unlike in sharepoint if i gave you a link to a file and document library you'd immediately mm -hmm. download it but in sharepoint embedded not necessarily you don't get access to it but you can open it up in the online version of word or excel or powerpoint or whatever and you can interact with the content that way but you can't download it prevent download I think yeah. it's amazing because when you That's think awesome. about the license implications, you think about the separate partition for data storage, and you think about large enterprises that are using this for at scale business processes where you might have hundreds of thousands of documents that are generated a week or a month. Mm -hmm. um, incredible capability set. It's it is that Sarah, and then think so. Let, let me so let me throw let me throw some uh, like some whipped cream and a cherry on top of that one. Um, Think about a company that made an app that was like in a regulatory type of, type of a scenario. And each company that would buy this app may be in different industries that have different requirements. Well, if they've got purview set up for their industry and the terms that they have to have for their industry, and then company B doesn't have that same those same kind of requirements, they can both use the app because all the content that's going inside that SharePoint embedded partition is all going to respect the exact same security and compliance and rules and everything that are all defined by that company's tenants purview configuration, right? Mm. So all of that stuff, and now I don't have to, then this company that's making this app no longer has to say, we have to go through and stand up all these other features that we've got to build, we got to maintain, we got to make sure they're going to get certified. Now it's just like, now nah, we're going to use what Microsoft has already been certified for. And if you haven't paid for a license for it, you just don't get those features. If you want those features, you got to pay Microsoft for a license to use those features but they'll all apply to our content inside this app as well. Gotcha. Amazing. Very interesting. So, so, Andrew, you, go ahead, Mike, yes. So you mentioned about different containers, and this is how you can set the permissions. How easy is, is it part of the app that you create the containers, or you let the users basically say, now I have this case in a law firm example, for example, I'm going to have a new case, I'm just going to go create a container or create a, a file folder or whatever that is, or is it the developer that has to do it for? The developer does everything. So yeah. the developer does everything with this. The only okay. kind of UI that the customer is going to have into the SharePoint embedded, uh, into into the SharePoint embedded uh, partition that they have for their tenant, the only visibility that they have is they can see that there are containers in their partition. They can see how many there are and how big they are for billing reasons, but they mm -hmm. can't get to the content inside of it. They can't make changes to it. There is a nuclear break glass in case of fire type thing where 
the CEO calls in the middle of the night and said, hey, we've got content that's stored in here that was that we are not legally allowed to do this. I know the developers can fix this, but we got to get rid of it right now. There is a nuke this container to get rid of everything um, inside of that one container, uh, but it is not easy to do. It's like it's in, it's intended to be like a seriously like a really, really bad thing uh, that you have to do it like the. Again, break glass in case of fire. Last right. resort type of thing. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, like a law, like a lawsuit or like a judge's order or something yeah. like that that would force it. Or there is a way to do that where you're not like forced. Like it's going to take time. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. Now you said that licensing is consumption based. Mm -hmm. Is it purely based on storage, or it also based on access or pulling the data, API calls, or is it purely how much data you're storing? It's it's a it uh, yes. <laughs> it's all uh, to answer all those. So uh, the way it works, all the billing is going to go through Azure because Azure is set up for meter billing. Yeah. Um, there are I'll, I'll talk about first the meter, the three meters that we have, and then I'll talk about where, how you can configure it because that's also flexible. Um, the three meters you're going to get billed on is uh, storage. So it's something like, let's see if I can remember this on the top of my head, 0.000667 per gigabyte. Cents okay, wow. uh, dollars per gigabyte or cents per gigabyte. Zero dollars okay. point zero zero. I think it's three zeros, yeah. and then six six seven. Um, that's one, um, and that's a snapshot that's taken on a uh, like an average of a daily basis. Um, so whatever you have at that time is when is where you get billed for. Um, that's one. Uh, another one that you're going to get is number of API calls uh, using Microsoft Graph that your app that the app is responsible for. So if I have if I use the app to upload a file, that's one, download the file, that's two, open the, um, make edits to the file, that's three. But if my app then, if the user says, I want to I want to edit the file in, in Excel online, then they'll click on a link and Excel will open the file up and I make my changes in Excel and then save it and close Excel. Those don't count against me because that's not my app that's doing that stuff. That's That's Microsoft stuff doing that. So anything where you're using graph, Microsoft Graph to make edits to the files, that's what you get charged for. And then the third meter is um, uh, data egress. So the amount of content you pull out of those SharePoint embedded uh, containers. Um, the way it's set up is, and this gets a little like in the weeds here. So I'm going to do, I'm going to do kind of a high level of it, but not get too, too deep on this on, on, unless you're interested the so there's two different roles that we play in this so there's the developer the person who built the app so that would be like let's let's call it contoso made this product that anybody can use and they can store content in sharepoint embedded um and then there's fabricam which is a customer of contoso that buys the app but the content's going to be stored in fabricam's 365 tenant okay what happens is is that the the developer who made the app creates this thing great create a microsoft intro application um then they create a what's called a container type. And what that does is that, not a content type, that that connects the intra app to all of the containers in the customer's tenant to that app. So that's kind of like the bridge between them. When the customer buys the, the, the product, the developer has to get the customer to register that app inside their tenant and what that does is that essentially gives the developers application access to create containers in the customer's tenant so what you end up doing is you marry up or you connect that container type to an azure subscription to tie into billing now the billing is set up in two two different options there's either developer uh, billing or it's passed through so developer billing is as Contoso, who built the app, I can go through and incur all of the charges for the app, and then I can mark it up to you and send you a bill based on consumption. Or I can instead just say, I'm going to sell a license to this app. You pay for the, the usage of it. So the billing is going to be passed through to your Azure subscription, the, cu the customer subscription, not the developer's subscription. So those are the two options. The second one I just said, the, the pass through one, that just went live like in the last two or three weeks. Um, I was waiting to see, actually I presented about this at a recent conference in Washington, DC, and the like 10 minutes before I went on stage, I was waiting to see if it was gonna go live or not because I had to review all the docs for it and put and publish them. And I was like, 
are they going to go through and publish those docs to say it's live yet? And sure enough, like I found out the first time that they were live during my session. So that's really, really recent um, that they've added that feature. Is there any financial benefits to option one versus option two, or it's, it's a case by case scenario kind of thing? It's a, it's a scenario based. It's basically okay. what, how does the developer want to support it? Um, how do they want to sell the app? It's a, it does, there's no cost benefit to it. Okay. No, there's no downside, no upside to it. It's just who, who's going to incur the cost. And it, um, the nice thing is that Microsoft is letting the developer uh, define the the business model uh, that they want to implement for their application. So it's more of a business decision than it is a technical or a, um, a costing and saving uh, model. Okay. It's nice that the option is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some cool scenarios that people are doing with it. Um, like the legal one was one I, I just said, uh, healthcare seems to be really interested in this. Mm -hmm. um, I got I could see that. Uh, Microsoft had me create a uh, two day, uh, create the content and deliver a workshop uh, for them when this was still under pri uh, private preview. I think might have been public preview. I can't remember which one it was, but back in March of 2024 of this year, um, I delivered a two day workshop for them for a bunch of customers. And looking at the list of companies, I was surprised at how many were healthcare. Um, but it really is going across all kinds of verticals. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a it's a nice option to have because as a, as a SharePoint developer, I mean, doing this 20 years, this came up at least once a month that somebody would ask this yeah. question. Exactly. This does lead me to think about what use cases you would use it in. Like one obvious use case is if you're an ISV that builds an app and you sell an app on SharePoint or you sell an app and you need some place to store Mm -hmm. documents, content, mm -hmm. and you want to take advantage of all those features, right? The ISV use case, I think it's pretty clear. Another one that I think you've talked about a little bit is if you want to build your own line of business application on top of SharePoint and you need to store content somewhere. Mm -hmm. Are there any yep. others that you, any other high level use cases like that? Or are those the two primary? Those are the two primary ones. The thing that, I mean, it's it's really just, you're either going to build, you're, you're going to build a multi-tenant app where I create the app and then all of you are my customers. So that's the more, uh, the multi-tenant scenario or single tenant where I create the app, but it's really only intended to be used by me and my company. So I'm both the developer and the customer of the app. I may have users coming from outside my tenant to interact with it, but the content is going to be the content in the application reside inside of my tenant boundary. Um, the thing that I see get, that I see trip people up with this is I, why wouldn't I use this for everything um, to store my content? And the answer is because you do pay a premium for on the chart on the on the um, uh, on a cost perspective for storing your content in SharePoint, um, it is more expensive than storing your content in like Azure storage blobs, um, yeah. because you're getting all of those ECM features, you're getting all that purview capability, you're getting access to all the AI stuff that SharePoint Premium is going to have has to offer. Um, so there is there is a, a cost associated with it. So I've seen a couple of customers like going, yeah, we're going to go through and put. All of our new apps are going to store everything inside SharePoint Embedded. I'm like, are you doing anything ECM or you just need a place to store your files? And they're like, we just need a place to store our files. I'm like, you do know you're paying for a lot more than you really are going to be using. So it may not be the right scenario for you. Granted, it's great to say it all lives in your tenant, but is it the right scenario? But this That's is where vertical and industry is so important because, as you said, yeah. I can see healthcare and other regulated industries love this because they have to provide all of those extra capabilities and you anyway and being able to leverage defender and all of those things is fantastic yeah and the content stays in their tenant not in the company yeah. that they bought it from that's right that is true. yeah that's huge that's absolutely huge so yeah it's it's been interesting watching i've been working with a few companies early on with this that are doing it like i've got i have a couple coaching clients that are isvs that are like we want to add sharepoint embedded as an additional storage option for the product that we already have and um, it's really interesting to see how they're doing that and more importantly, how their customers are flocking to it. Sure. So when they see that as an option that's being offered, they're like, oh yeah, we got it. We're getting a demand for this. They've always wanted to store stuff in SharePoint, but we had to have a very structured way of them accessing the content. So we yeah. couldn't just do it in a document library. We didn't want people doing like Power Automate and stuff and being able to access the document library through the web and potentially screw stuff up. So this is a great option to shut all that stuff off and we have full control over accessing the content. Yeah. I, 
two more slightly as as we elbow each other for questions sometimes two more semi-technical questions one is um you talked about kind of at the top level you have a partition well, i like that word so i'll keep using that word a partition for sharepoint embedded can you have more than one partition in a tenant so you already do you have one for sharepoint online you've got one for right. onedrive and then you have one sharepoint embedded yeah. so if you bought like if you went through and you had four SharePoint embedded apps that your company had purchased from vendors and you were using them, they're all storing all of their content in the same SharePoint embedded partition. Okay. Just like if you're using Loop in your tenant, you also have all that Loop content is also in that same SharePoint embedded partition. Um, there is, I think the limit, and just to give you some, some perspective on like the scale of this, I think that the current limit right now, and it's a very soft limit because the team is basically saying, hey, if you need to go above this, call us and let's talk about it because we want to understand the scenario. Um, they can support it. They just want to understand it. But each app in each tenant can have up to 100,000 containers. So one container type can create 100,000 containers in a tenant. So if I bought, if I had an app that was doing like legal stuff and all three of you were in, had law firms and you all purchased my product, I would have a hundred thousand in Antonio, up to a hundred thousand Antonios, a hundred thousand Sarahs, a hundred thousand in Mike's uh, containers uh, that are all tied to my app that I could be interacting with. And those um, would all be in the same SharePoint embedded partition. partition. They would be in each of your own SharePoint embedded our, partition. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so if you were, if you understand, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. If you each like all, there's four 365 tenants involved in this. Me as the developer one for Sarah, one for Mike, one for Antonio. Um, all of the content is in all of the tenants except for me as the developer. Okay. Right. The other question I had was when you do interact with um, the SharePoint embedded partition through, you know, your, your, your app is calling APIs. Mm -hmm. um, are any of those interactions stored in the M365 audit log? Or do you have yeah. to maintain your own audit log? No, they are. They are my understanding. I would want to go back, back and double check this. Uh, my understanding is yes, they are all still stored in your own Microsoft 365 audit log. You, I would presume you only are going to have access to see it though via the app. So the app has to expose that. That I may be, I may be a little, so I may, I may fudge on this a little bit because. There may be a whole thing with like records holds and stuff uh, through purview and with uh, Defender that you can like do records holds, you can do like discovery of content um, that may impact it a little bit. And I'm not entirely sure if the audit logs would then be visible also through purview or not. Okay. I'm not going to, I'm going to claim a little bit of ignorance on that one. It was really okay. funny when they were doing this, the purview guys were, it seemed to me the purview guys were kind of flipping out about this and they're like, Wait a minute, you're going to give people access to all of these features and not get a license cost associated with it? So I was like, hey, man, I'm just a developer. I just show you how to build this stuff. Not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, so wrapping up, any tips that you would give either to developers or companies that want to use this, just how do they get started or, you know, mistakes to avoid? Yeah, I would uh, think, so the big thing, I guess, how to get started, go read these two links that I'm gonna put in the show notes uh, or in the videos, which they are not for GA. They're all for, they're all still for like public preview. So I, I need to refresh them because there's some stuff that you don't have to do than the dev one. Like you used to have to turn SharePoint embedded on in your tenant. You don't have to do that anymore. It's automatically turned on on all of our tenants by default. Um, I would, those are two ways to get started with it. Um, there are also links in those articles that point to the official docs. Um, the team is working, they're constantly adding features. I'm having a little bit of a hard time keeping up with what they're doing, um, even as close as I am to them. The one thing that I would say that I've seen trip up people more than anything with this, um, it's two things. Number one, this is just Microsoft Graph. So once the app, once you've got the core piece of the app and like the app is registered uh, or the, the app and the con container type are both registered and then the, are created and then the, the container type is registered in the customer's tenant. Once that's done, it's just Microsoft Graph to read and write data. When you want to create a container, that is a separate in, that is a separate call that you have to do. That is a um, that is a little new, uh, but it's not it's not hard to do. It's very simple. 
uh, and it'll look very familiar to to a developer. Um, so that's one. Don't treat it like it's something brand new. Treat it like it's stuff I already know. The other one that I see really trip people up with this is their information architecture, because everyone I've talked to, like you should have seen the room when we were all talking about IA, and the guy that one of the guys that owns the IA side of it was kind of just sitting there just watching the discussion. And we're all talking about apps that are like in the tens, maybe some reach to a hundred, but we're talking about like the couple or tens of containers with folders and content inside of it. And he just kind of like comes in. He's like, just so you know, each app can have up to hundred thousand containers inside of a tenant. And if you need more than that, call us, we can definitely raise the limit. We just want to understand what you're doing. And so to that, I think it's that and every, the, the conversation completely changed when that happened. So it's more that you think of a container first and foremost as a security construct. So the mm-hmm. lowest level of like how I would secure my content is how I would is when it would cause me to create another container. Again, best example there, law firm, diff, um, new matter. Each container is new matter. All lawyers can be able to, that are associated with that matter should be able to see the content inside of that container. If you need to block it from someone. That's why you wouldn't do subfolders because you can't block access to a subfolders to someone. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Andrew, always great to talk to you. That's a lot of information. We always learn from you. So thank you. It was very informative here. Thanks Actually, for th- thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's been fun. Always thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.